Welcome to Sinister Heroes. I'm your host, Danny Iniquitous. Thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the channel, this is a channel about Dungeons and Dragons where we try to take a darker tone with everything we do here. So if you like edgy kind of content, definitely like and subscribe. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters. We love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. And a big thank you to our good friends at Dice Legion. Use the promo code Sinister and get 10% off all of your purchases. The link to both of those is in our descriptions. Without further ado, we're going to jump into this week's video where we talk about Baldur's Gate 3 and its impact on D&D. So first and foremost, I am a big fan of Baldur's Gate 3. I, I really enjoy the game. I think it's well done. I think it's amazing. I think it sets the bar really high for video games as a whole. Uh, that being said, there are things about it that are going to be specifically impactful on how D&D &D games are run. And I think that's important to address how um, outside mediums are going to influence and change how your games work. Uh, first and foremost, I gotta say, love the game, and uh, they have made changes and improvements that I do think will be seen pretty regularly from here on out. Um, and I think that's because of the amount of people that enjoy the game uh, and are interested in playing the actual um, TTRPG that is Dungeons and Dragons are going to be kind of flocked into this kind of idea of expectations that Baldur Gates. Three sets for them, uh, especially if you've played BG3 first and never played Dungeons and Dragons. So I want to address some of those things and some of those concepts um, and give a couple of examples if I can about how that kind of works out. One of the more noticeable things is how Baldur's Gate 3 handles long rests. Uh, in the game uh, of Dungeons and Dragons, dependent on your group, a long rest can be a few things. It can be, all right, we're taking a long rest, reset everything, Let's go on. It's the next day. What do you guys want to do? Or if you're a more role play heavy group, long rests are kind of similar to the way they are in BG3, where you take the long rests and then characters will do things. They'll get involved with stuff. Maybe if they have a patron, a patron will contact them or, or something along those lines. Uh, and that is a great showcase of what role playing is like. Uh, because it really gives you those opportunities to see those things happen and to play them out in your game. I'm a role play heavy player, uh, so those kinds of things really drive me. Like I love it when my character interacts with other characters and they start to mesh and different ideas start to be shared or you start to get some of the background of who they are. Uh, and Boulder's Great 3 does this great thing with like just slowly adding story as it happens. Uh, and I think that's very well done. Again, they're professional writers that have lots of teams working on it and, and going backwards and forwards and writing stories. And they really put a lot of effort into it uh, as a company. So you kind of expect that. So yeah, maybe that's a very high standard. But when you're role playing with the group, you can very easily achieve your group's level of, of role play within that format and still get a very well... Uh, interesting story developed from your characters interactions and certain characters will like each other more you know just you kind of just grow naturally like that I I must say that they it's so great that so much stuff happens that it never feels like a long rest is just a wasted opportunity and I think that's something that a lot of DMs are gonna start to pick up on especially if they play Boulder's Gate 3 and then they're going back into playing uh, regular Dungeons and Dragons and no matter what the medium is they're now seeing what can be done, like opening a door of options. Uh, and I think that the more options you have to tell a story and the, the more chances that your players will pick up on that and you'll develop a more role play oriented group because you're kind of setting yourselves up to, to, to have these moments. The way checks and uh, roles are happening in Boulder's Gate 3 uh, did kind of open my eyes to some things, especially in combat. Uh, and maybe this is something that your party has already knew or you had players that already do this. But for me, the rogue got so much better because of the use of hide in combat. I had always perceived it as something that's just hiding behind like, a, you, I mean, you obviously have, you should have a logical reason behind how you're taking the, the hide action in combat. But seeing what you can do with that action as a rogue is just dynamic it, it never occurred to me that uh, you would still be hiding and hence could be an unseen attacker and give yourself advantage uh, all the rules are there it works rules is written um, 
but seeing it in action made the rogue that much better for me uh, in combat and understanding its faculties and how it how its strengths really are. And it really was creative. Uh, I thought that was a really unique and intelligent way to handle that. Uh, and maybe your parties do that already. But it's little subtle things like that that kind of show the rules in play in a very locked down black or white format. Uh, because obviously it's a video game and certain things have to fit in order for it to work through the stories. There has to be rules and those rules have to have actions and consequences and, and, and hard lines between them because, again, it's a video game. But I think it makes a lot of sense the way they do it, the way they do insight checks, arcana checks, perception checks. Just like as they go on, it seems more so as it's something that's based on maybe your passive and you're seeing these things happen as they go forward, which is a very cool thing to do. I like how the roles are incorporated with um, a little story or a segment of something. If you're in, con in a conversation and you roll insight, you gain a little depth, even if you fail, as to what exactly is going on. Um, and I think that really affects things well. And that's a good DM trick. A lot of DMs use that that I've experienced. But I think it makes all your actions wholesome and matter more. One of the other concepts that I see a lot, uh, especially when I talk to people about Baldur's Gate 3 who are playing as the Dark Urge, having an evil party or running an evil playthrough or an evil campaign is done is done pretty well in Baldur's Gate 3. You can take all these evil actions and it it really reflects how even if your whole party doesn't align with you perfectly with everything, it shows a great way how the world reacts to what you're doing. Uh, and it helps to curb your your murder hoboness because you know well enough if you just attack everything you see it's going to be bad for you and you will not win these fights and you can risk a lot of things just because you're you were insulted so you were like no my character wouldn't act like this and then just like decided to fight something stronger than you it gives you a nice framework for evil campaigns and evil aligned players uh, it, it shows you a great way for them to go through the story and still be able to achieve their goals. I think it opens a lot of ideas that way, especially how societies see you and, and, and your interactions with them after you've harmed them. Uh, because if you make certain choices, people are like, yeah, no, get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. And that kind of a punishment can impede you greatly in a video game because say you, 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 know, you killed a, a, a shopkeeper or something. Now what do you do when there's no other shopkeepers around? And you have like loads of stuff you can't get rid of and tons of stuff you have to pick up and everything's now encumbered or, or you got to go travel bizarre lengths just to be able to offload any of the stuff that you need to offload. It shows a great level of, of consequence to your actions. And it does that really well that even though it's punishing, it still gives you the opportunity to thrive throughout the game how you wish to. And I like that idea because I like playing evil characters, but I like the fact that there's still options that you can still compete and complete the game in a way that fits personally to you. Uh, and it opens a way for people who don't want to just deal with it because they think it might be just very difficult, but shows them that it's if you follow a lot of the framework here that they use in BG3 with the townsfolk and how they react to you, I think that that really helps to soften the blow or the fear or the insecurity about running campaigns with evil characters in them. So maybe we'll see a lot more of us, which would be great. Some of the things I also liked is how they did some of the species. Like humans got like really buff because you can equip shields and spears and stuff like that on any class. So you can be a sorcerer or a wizard and still rock a shield and really help yourself up your AC. And I think it's thematic for the humans to kind of be like that, to be able to just to pick up a shield and like a stick or something. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. I do feel, however, most of the species don't feel as good. I feel like even if they're carbon copies of the how of how they are in Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of them feel a lot lackluster and unimpressive. I do like some of the changes they made to classes. I like the ranger changes. I love what they did with the Beastmaster. I think that was great. I like what they did with the monk. The monk is very powerful now. Um, 
it's an interesting concept of what they could do. Again, they can create whatever magic items they want and things like that and help bolster the class and, and make other things that do specialized abilities and tricks like that. But I do think, uh, as far as species go, they kind of just drop the ball outside of the human. I think the, the half-elf is great because, again, they can equip shields on top of anything else. Um, and they still get all of their other varying abilities. I feel just... Outside of the Tiefling and the Drow, I really don't want to play anything else. Uh, and I feel like that's so much more limiting than it is in the actual game. And I can't tell you for a factual reason why that is. Uh, a lot of them are exactly the same. I just I just don't get it. Um, but changes they made to classes are good because obviously it's a video game. So you have to constitute that for it to work. The problem is it's it's a video game. Uh, every monster you'll see, every character, every boss in the game will have a set number of HP, a set number of everything, and it will never change. It'll be that exact same number basically throughout your playthrough unless you up the difficulty, which it might change variably. In situations like that, this is where min-maxing and multi-classing and doing things like that will greatly, greatly benefit you. Because it's kind of built for that. This is like kind of my standpoint that happens a lot um, in all of my discussions about multiclassing. In uh, D&D, all that stuff can change. You can fight just different monsters. They can, the DM can just replace them and fit it with whatever circumstance you need it to be. Um, if your party isn't a whole bunch of min-maxers, they can make... They can choose other monsters to supplement for those fights and make their boss characters a reflection or maybe just a reskin of another class of monster or, or quality of monster. So that way it fits the difficulty of that's appropriate for the kind of party you're playing with. Whereas in a video game, you can't do that. This is a difficulty setting. This is the boss you're fighting. So in that kind of a circumstance, it's circumstances where multi-classing is going to do significantly better because you now can hit those numbers and have it really make more of a definitive effect because you're always fighting these same monsters. Uh, if you're in this area, you're going to fight all spiders and, and underdark things. If you're in this area, all you're going to fight is animals like bears and wolves. And this is the kind of circumstance that multiclassing and things like that is really made for. It's because it's a set number, it's a set difficulty, it's always going to be this way. So having your highest availability of your power at any given point will make these fights significantly easier for you. In normal D&D, it's not always set that way. You have the availability to change those things around. A DM can make things more difficult if he has to or easier if he has to. So baselining a damage per round equation isn't as necessary in regular D&D because you fight and these combats are just supposed to be challenging and that is varying between the kind of party you have so you don't need to make situations where you have super heavy difficulty monsters at level one that you need everyone else to be hardcore min max in order to be able to survive it doesn't have to be that way but if you crank up the difficulty and you're playing in boulders gate three then yeah, you need to multi-class. You need to get multiple things. You need to get very specific builds because those kinds of things are going to be the determining factor if you're capable of winning a fight or if you can uh, or if you even just walk through it because it's a video game and that's the sequence where you're always fighting. It does not change. You could play through the game a hundred times. If you make the same choices and find yourself in the same area, you're fighting the same monsters does not change and for that and that specific reasoning of how video games are built and organized it really creates a great circumstance to really power game and create multi-class and characters how this will transfer over into regular DD, &D, i think uh obviously multi-classing is a very popular thing now and a lot of people do it I think more people that are playing BG3 first and then going to D&D are going to probably, and their initial characters are probably going to involve a lot of multi-classing and a lot of uh, theory crafting and building and research online for builds because 
that's a big stepping off point into a different medium where you have a lot of things that you're already familiar with that you know are effective that you can really bring to the forefront. As far as world building is concerned, I think Baldur's Gate 3 does a great job of giving you a lot in a very limited amount of space. Uh, you go to, from the way the story works into that whole first act, you get to go from a Mind Flayer ship to a grove to a city, to a goblin encampment, to the Underdark, to a hag's lair, to, to uh, a Githyanki uh, stronghold, like, you know, a whole bunch of gnolls. Like, there's, there's so much in such a small square footage of area. It kind of sets every, and it kind of sets this very condensed version of the world. Which is great, there's so much history, there's so much to pull for in D&D &D that you can have all those things in your campaign and it doesn't necessarily look like a bad thing or something that's unusual. Uh, if you were going to translate Boulder's Great Gate 3 into a D&D &D campaign, you would probably have to spread those areas out over a great distance. Normally everything is not that close. I mean a goblin encampment to a city is not that close because the goblins will probably get murdered by the city as soon as they find out they're there. That's usually kind of how it works. And that's kind of how it works here in uh, Baldur's Gate 3 if you decide to, to make it so. Um, but if, if you want to incorporate many multiple ideas into your campaign, uh, and Baldur's Gate really doesn't do a lot to kind of help this and again it's because it's a video game and because it has to make things kind of linear even if there are multiple paths you can take it does have to follow a somewhat linear approach if you have multiple things like this happening in your campaign especially early on you have to be prepared for your party to latch on to one idea and to go running in one direction with that full steam ahead uh, and that's something that that happens because some things are just interesting and your party just gravitates towards. And there's really not much you can do about that. It's really actually a sign of you being that good at that idea that, like, this is what the party wants to do. Uh, you know, so it does a good job of setting up a lot of options, a lot of things going on in one area. The real issue is if you spread that out and gave a lot of opportunity to follow specifically those paths, it would greatly change how the campaign would be every single time you play. Boulder's Gate 3 has a lot of things going on, a lot of different options, a lot of different paths you can take, which is cool. Fundamentally, it is a linear theory behind it. You're, you start out the game, you have this problem, you need to fix it. You will pursue this problem until you fix it. And then once you fix it, you will pursue a different problem and fix it. And this will kind of repeat until the game ends. Having linear games and campaign ideas is great because it gives you a direct line. This is your goal. This is what you need to do. This is how you achieve it. Having open world is very difficult in D, D games because it creates too many options and then you kind of get stuck with decision anxiety where you want to do everything uh, but obviously there's no time because time marches forward uh, so it does give you a good idea of a false sense of open world because it does give you this feel that, oh, you could do everything. And then once you do everything in the area, you're like, oh, all right, let me go to the next area. But then it continues the main story anyway. Uh, so it does it does give you this false sense of open-worldness, which I think is really great and captivating because it makes the world have more depth. And the more you care about the world around you and the NPCs and things like that in both games, the more interested you are and the more excited you are to interact with them and try and see what you can do to change that kind of scape and landscape and political landscape or, or power dynamics. Like I said before, I really, really do enjoy Baldur's Gate 3. I think it's amazing. Uh, if you haven't played it, I think you should. One of the most important things is I think it really gives you a good scope of what it is like to play D&D. &D. Uh, it gives you a good understanding of how the combats are and how they're more involved and the more meaningful and impactful they are, the better it is as opposed to just running around and constantly killing like creeps or something just so you can get strong enough to keep going. Um, with that in 
conjecture. I really just wanted to uh, say that I think it's a great idea if you're a starting DM and you want to pull some ideas from somewhere and you're playing the game, pull a lot of ideas of how things are run and how ideas are met and, and how these characters and species all treat each other differently. I love the way they treat tieflings and drow. Like, I love that so much. They're my favorite race to, 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 to play. And how people perceive you is really, really dynamically cool and important. And they bring that really to the forefront. So it shows you that your species, your choices, make an immediate impact on how people see you in the world of D&D. Uh, and Baldur's Grade 3 really does that. That's another great point that they have. They kind of give you more of a social understanding of what it's like to be in that world. Uh, that being said, we're going to bring this video to a close. If you've made it this far, uh, thank you so much for all of your support. Definitely hit like and subscribe. Uh, thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, the link is in the description, as well as the link to our good friends at Dice Legion. Use the promo code SINISTER and get 10% off all of your purchases. And with all that said and done, thank you for giving a spooky kid a chance. Mm -hmm.